So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the IMKL Series 2020. Uh, we are back here uh, for our first uh, expert speaker session. Um, this uh, session will focus on the infrastructure uh, angle of the economic recovery uh, of Malaysia, short term, uh, medium term, and also long term. Uh, before we begin our session by Dato Nichi, um, I'd like to recap what was said uh, during the session by Yang Berbahagia Datuk Sri Mustafa Muhammad, which is our minister at the Prime Minister's Department. There were basically three key points that was relatable to the infrastructure of Malaysia. First of all, was that uh, the minister said that the infrastructure development or redevelopment is uh, crucial for economic recovery uh, going into the next uh, three to five years. Uh, also mentioned that the construction sector as a whole is interlinked with over 140 subsectors of the economy, which makes sense uh, in terms of <coughs> thinking about what policy, policy measures that could come through uh, under Budget 2021 and 12 uh, Malaysia Plan uh, relating to the revival of the construction or infrastructure sector over the medium uh, to long term. The third point that came in from uh, YB session um, was that there are three key events uh, going into the second half of the year uh, and also the first quarter of next year, uh, which are first the economic recovery plan announcement, uh, more of a mid-term to long-term uh, timeline. Second is the budget 2021, uh, which will be announced uh, sometime in October, uh, which typically is an event that is uh, highly uh, anticipated by infrastructure players, construction companies, and also related industry uh, bodies in terms of what is in store for the sector over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And the final event that YB highlighted was the announcement of the 12th Malaysia Plan, which would come through sometime in the early part of uh, 2020. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to our session, uh, how this session flows through with what YB has said is that this session uh, is titled Malaysia's uh, Transport Infrastructure and also Reviving Malaysia's Infrastructure Privatization. And for that, we have today uh, Yang Berbahagia Datunichi, uh, whom is a fellow of the Institution of Engineers and also rather more well known as the CEO of HSS Engineers, which, by the way, is one of the prominent engineering consultancy companies in Malaysia, perhaps the region. Me. Okay. So, um, what will this session focus is three things. One, that Tonichi will talk about uh, briefly on the history of Malaysia's public transportation infrastructure, look through a few historical projects, and probably touch on potential new projects that's going to come through next year, and maybe give some ideas to the government in terms of what mega project options that can be put on the table going into the next three to five years. Secondly, the session will also look at the feasible implementation model where Datuk Nichi will look at how the private sector can play a more effective role with the government in executing its infrastructure plans. And finally, what is the best way forward? So, without further ado, I would like to call upon Datuk Nichi to take the stand and begin the presentation. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Arisa. Uh, morning, everyone. And, uh... Welcome, uh, distinguished guests, whether uh, present physically or virtually. If I may just start the sun, if you look. The content of my presentation today is divided into four distinct parts. Actually, they are highly interrelated, consisting of uh, two, two topics, Malaysia's public transport as well as the sustainable model for infrastructure privatization. <coughs> what seemingly actually not con do not seem to be connected they are actually, in essence, very highly connected. Uh, let me start first by actually just showing you a bit of a history of the public transport in Malaysia. This is the background. If you look, uh, this is the history of public transport, you know, when they became regulated. If you look at uh, bus, LRTs, monorail, trains, uh, MRT, taxis. Taxis became a bit more organized in the 1990s. But more importantly, I left out something here called LPTA. LPTC, Land Public Transport Commission. Do you remember between 2010 and 11, as a series of labs, this entity was created? <clears throat> Just keep in mind, if you do remember, if you look at the timeline, look at 1995, there's a gap. There's something called LTA across the border down south. Uh, 
uh, called Land Transport Authority. You don't see that on the slides, though. Just, just remember that LTA out of Singapore was created in 1985, and our SPAT, or LT, uh, Land Public Transport Commission, was created in 2011. A uh, bit of a background on uh, our neighbors down south. LTA was actually a, a, garbage, a, a mixture of the public uh, works department of uh, Singapore's uh, uh, works department relating to roads and public transport as well. Even they took over the licensing uh, obligations of the road transport department, and yet they were placed under the Minister of Transport and they do remain there still. If you go back and look at our LPTC, you know, it was created with dual purpose as well, uh, to actually look at infrastructure in the public space. More, more relevantly is actually to concentrate on urban infrastructure, urban transportation being primarily the concern. You know, the idea was actually to, uh, to move something called modal shift from private vehicles to public transport effectively. Uh, unfortunately, it took on also the role of licensing, regulating, or something called over-regulating. See, <laughs> we even took over commercial vehicle licensing board. In Singapore, you could do that. It was an island nation. Malaysia is too big a country to, to, to do that. Actually, they should have just concentrated on development of the infrastructure part of public transport. They would have done well. There may be a case for them to go <clears throat> a bit more higher than just merely a department called APAT now. Okay, I'll leave that there. I move on. If you look at the definition here, this slide, the word takeaway is actually public. If you actually look at the word public transport, if you look at the first part, you look at all the toll highways approximately that can be located in the Klang Valley. If you go back and think, actually these are not private, uh, they are public, public projects in essence. They are actually assessed that the government has granted assess right to a public private sector to actually implement uh, a public project. You know, do, do not ever forget that, you know. That's the most important takeaway on this slide. They are actually public, public project, but the government has given a right to cess, to collect a cess on behalf of the government. You know, and it is rightfully got to be regulated, but again, the role of government got to be re-examined. Uh, and the rest, you know, railway network, you know, the share, now we haven't gone into grab and everything. Started off well, now they're being regulated and they're not so, so savvy anymore. And the next slide, again, goes for the argument as to why uh, public transport is important. If you do, do see the mix, the takeaway from this slide is the last 2016 to 2019, the growth of the share of the public transport in the Klang Valley. Uh, you will see that is approximately 20%. If I do remember well, out of the Pomandu Labs in 2010, 2011, the target was 40%, model shift from 20 to 40. But do remember, you know, 85 to 90% of these journeys are actually related to business, work, or, or even uh, student, or we call educational trips, which are actually compulsory and actually happens during Monday to Friday. Forget about your leisure trips on public transport. If it happens, it's called coincidental. It is actually does not provide a stable revenue, strictly cash into the system. And then we have the other call, economic case. The three economic cases that we tend to argue, uh, GDP, yep, you save travel time, you, you increase productivity, very good. Is it measurable? No, because there's no accrual system to acknowledge that. So a well-known case, you know, if you go back and do transport economics, which my background is, you are actually you're unable to accrue. Very hard to accrue, so that's why you go around the economic route. But there's a solution, not to worry. Same with environment as well. Climate change, everything drives. So do you go green with cars as well? Do you go public with cars? So there's a lot of argument for that. And of course, safety, redu reduction of uh, accidents. That's why we have Miro sitting under MOT as well. So these are all what we call the intangibles, the immeasurables, but they make a wonderful case when you actually argue along the lines of an economic case. But there's a flaw. Again, why do we actually uh, talk about urban population? Urban, urban, urban. Why do people migrate to urban? Have you ever asked the question? Employment, isn't it? Very basic necessity of life. So is there a case to actually decentralize transport such that they don't become urban transport, that they become merely transport? Is that something that we want to ponder over for some time? If you look at the charts there, you know, I have actually purposely shown the growth, GDP growth and the construction growth in terms of GDP. If you look at this from a case of a demand and supply, how do you match demand and supply? It doesn't differ whether it's privatized, government money, it's all about how do you actually account for capital. 
how do you actually utilize capital correctly? Unfortunately, the, the construction that is shown in, uh, let me get my glasses, in blue is, is, is actually the quick, quick fix. <clears throat> That's actually where we say, you know, growth, GDP growth, GDP growth from construction sector. I think that song has been sung for, for far too long huh, because the other part is very difficult to measure. The red is very, very difficult to measure. How do you accrue, accrue it unless you actually specify the cash flows that can be accrued to a private government entity? Yes, they are what I call deferred benefits. Deferred benefits are the economic case that we always run to when we cannot justify something from a financial case. Okay, so that's the difference. Huh? So if, if, if the questions later ask what job is coming on stream, typical of an analyst always asking, you know, what's quick to market? You know, what's going to happen to this project? What is, when is it going to happen? The, the, you included, Shaiza? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, there's a bigger picture here, actually. There's some arguments that you actually got to see. Actually, the rate, the rate is actually a deferred, deferred earnings to the government. And the problem with this deferred earnings, you can't accrue it through the system recognizably. It's always dispersed all over. Uh, again, population distribution in Malaysia, we see the right-hand corner of the slide, the case, why is that happening? Can't can we disperse uh, public spending to out, outer KL? Can't we create employment out of KL? Good example, I think I'm going to get is ECRL. Uh, it was actually, <coughs> the feasibility study for ECRL was, we did together with ECRDC, who are our clients, together with one of the big fours who did the economic case for it. It actually shows that employment in states of Pahang will increase because of the ECRL. And it is happening, actually. You do see investment coming through Pahang, actually, MCKIP, yes. But then again, you know, it doesn't happen by magic. When you do an economic case, you need policies, guided policies right throughout the scheme. You just don't make a decision and let the consequence happen by itself. Every decision has got a consequence. So how do you follow through with your consequence? Active, passive, so you need both active and passive policies to actually realize the, the, the red part of, of, of your growth down there that you're talk, talking about, especially when you can't seem to accrue it. Okay, because the accrual of, of the GDP of the country comes from all other sources. One of them is transport. One of them is infrastructure. <coughs> the next slide here just shows them the uh, growth. Why again uh, GDP growth? Why in cities? Again, the same question again. Why is everybody coming to so-called Klang, Klang Valley? And Klang Valley is growing from, Klang to K from KL to Klang Valley. I don't know. Then it became the greater Klang Valley. I, I'm still thinking of a nomenclature after this. Where do we go with it? It started off, as, when I entered the industry 33 years ago, it was KL. There was no, no. And then later, JICA studies came in, and then Klang Valley came in. Now we have the Greater Klang Valley. So where do we go now? And this migration of, of population to the urban centers are employment. There's nothing else. Major, major cause is employment. And why? Because we spend a lot of money in the urban centers. We create employment, we create economic activities. You know. Again, then you know, there's no surprises if you look at the candidates down there, state candidates, Slango, Colombo, Sarawak, Johor, these are the primary contributors to our GDP. They didn't happen by chance. It, it happened by, 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 by design. What, what, was it a design that was actually a default design or actually an active design that actually planted in the system that allowed these five states to grow? Good question, I'm leaving it. Again, at the bottom there, you see best targets for GDP is through journey times. Realistically, it is actually, productivity do increase. But how do you actually realize this? Again, uh, no surprise, the statistics at the bottom will show you. Again, the five, five states, you cut it anywhere. The growth of uh, registered vehicles, and then you see private cars, motorbikes, buses, the distribution on the top, the graph, and the bottom, Goods vehicle, public services vehicle, no problem. So on the right hand side, you see a pie, 50 50. Can we actually move towards that? It's too, too short a time. But do we need policies to move to active policies? Believe me, it's not going to happen by passive policies. There have got to be some active policies. In essence, this slide says that roads and other form of transport, even if you want to throw in and be a bit more aggressive, you could even air travel, domestic air travel. How, how do you see domestic air travel? Is it a transport? Then, you know, you, I mean, you're dealing with roads, you have what we call route choice in transport planning. But when you actually put transport into it, you have what we call modal choice. You start doing how, how do people make choices uh, in, in model 
whether they use railway, whether they use road, whether they fly, live, living along ships. I don't think people travel locally by ships. In essence, <coughs> the long and short long and short of it is, sorry. Yeah? Yep, okay, uh, public transport as choice of mobility. So mobility yeah, is actually a very big word. Actually, mobility, a lot of people see it differently. Uh, if you want to put a context to mobility in journey times, it's actually all about predictable journey times in a, in a public transport. Different. Can you actually predict journey times? The day I actually leave, the day I leave my, the time I leave my house, but I, how quick will it reach my destination? So they, they have something called door to door. And the missing equation here is something called the last mile. Because when we model public transport, we do nodal, nodal uh, modeling, whereby we re represent an area with a centroid. And then everybody lives in that centroid. You know? So the modeling cannot account for what we call the last mile. So how do you treat this last mile? So in essence, actually, last mile gives you a bit of flexibility. Can I go out after work, during work, uh, lunchtime, and have a lunch using a public transport? That is, in essence, uh, its mobility. It will give you flexibility to do something else. Is the public transport good enough for me actually to run to IRB and pay my taxes during lunch with or without taking leave? Again, you know, come, back, come back the last statement at the bottom. The NKRA uh, results we really wanted to achieve by 2030 uh, in Greater KL, the model shift from 2025 to, 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 to 40. And sadly, it's not happening really. Uh, slowly, it's happening. It's creeping. It's creeping because policies are active policies are not put into place to move that. Now, before I go into that, just let me just recap what's happening currently in, in Malaysia. Some of the uh, key public uh, transport projects. If you look at Klang Valley, double tracking one, started about three, four years ago. This was actually to increase the capacity of, of the commuter system in KTMB, uh, KL Klang, KL Rawang, and KL Sramban. The system was actually designed in 1994 with Ercon, and uh, it's timely now with the demand. Quite rightfully, the demand has increased, so you start supplying, you start increasing the capacity onto the system. So this was actually part of the labs, Pumandu labs as well. Gamas Tumpat, oh yeah, I'll leave it for the ECRL questions later. The British went to Gamas and started climbing through, through to, to the east coast, through the center of east coast, then didn't do the coastal. You know cities grow from coast as well. So the Brits, instead of cutting across the Tiwangsa range, came down to Gamas and climbed up through the center of Malaysia. They avoided the Tiwangsa range, and hence Gamas became a great railway exchange. Not because of that, but they took the roads across Genting Sapa, if you do remember, and they actually widened it later by MTD through a privatization scheme. So we have a dual tunnel. There. For those of you who are old enough, you'll remember when you traveled there, there was only a single tunnel many, many moons ago. MRT2, great case. Halfway through implementation, if you look at MRT1 as well, LRT3, yep, of course, they have changed. One and two, uh, two and three have actually changed the procurement structure because of the previous government. Klang Valley double tracking two is as a continuation of uh, phase one, is the same thing as well, enhancing capacity for commuter trains, where the, whereby the system has already reached its capacity. Good, good demand over time. Oh, almost it took 20 years to actually reach the demand. On the next, you will see what is ongoing. It's actually continuation of, of the Gamas JB. This is the last stretch of our double tracking. Also started in the 90s with the Klang Valley. Then we went up north. We went up to Rawang. We went up to Ipo. And now we have reached up to Parang Besar already. Well, we procured through an EPC contract. Down south, we did it in stages. From Sramban, we went to Gamas through Erkon. And then from Gamas all the way to JB through the consortium that we know now. It's un under construction now. I think it's YTL led, if I'm not mistaken. The one on the right is Kanda BRT we are directly involved in. Okay, we won this mandate in December last year. Again, very interesting. This is actually linked, if I may move forward a bit. Very strong correlation to the sorry. Did I skip a slide? I can't see. Yeah, actually the BRT job is closely related to the one in the center called Joho Singapore RTS. Okay, you know, a lot of uh, travel, work travel in Johor Bahru, if you actually come to realize, is actually relating to sending people to Singapore to work. Uh, they do have a substantial portion in Johor travel as well within Johor Bahru, but a lot of it is actually on private cars. If you actually cross, cross across to, into Singapore for work, to, there's 300,000 trips per day that is moving from Johor Bahru into Singapore. 
and I'm going across the so-called causeway, 80% causeway and the other 20% through to us. Okay, there was a case, actually, even you have reason to do the RTS to connect from, from, from Tanjung Putri using the Tuas. I think common sense prevailed and they've come back to, 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 to Bukit Chaga. Why Bukit Chaga, if I may go back, is also the... Uh, sorry, uh, Iskandar BRT, if you see that, the three lines. Iskandar BRT consists of bus rapid transit of three lines, all coming to culmination in Bukit Chaga, where the RTS begins on the Malaysian side before going into woodlands on the Singapore side. Okay? There are a bit of changes in there. Hopefully, that, that, that project goes ahead. I'm going to skip the rest. Of course, uh, as mentioned by Honorable Minister just now, we have the high speed on, on the cards with Singapore as well. And <clears throat> the other not so sexy ones is the uh, Bayan Lepas LRT or the Penang LRT. Of course, you know very well it's linked to reclamation you know, and other things that, you know, I'll take, take the questions during. And it's actually to give all some questions as well. And then, and again, the North and South Freight Bypass. This was a dream from KTM to, to release cargo traffic through a KL, KL Central, to have bypasses from the north to start from Srenda. Actually, 20 years ago, they started from Sungai Bulo. The bypass from north was supposed to start. But because of so rapid development, now we have moved it up to, to Srenda. If we wait, then we may have, may, may have to start it even from Ipoh. The, the bypass. Um, similarly, on the south, it is envisaged to, 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 to start in Sramban. It's still in Sramban because the demand really, the cargo traffic, you know, whether from Sramban is needed, whether you need the southern bypass, need to be re examined again, at least from my personal view. And the last bit is a mandate that we did for the state through the SEDC, Kuching Transit, very simply just showing desire lines without actually supplying anything, whether telling them whether it's a uh, ART, BRT, even a simple buses to, 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 to build up demand, you know, and even, of course, they had their own ideas. They wanted a hydrogen, now they want an ART, so nonetheless, we have stopped and said, wait, let's get our act together. But what we have there is the desire lines. The patterns are all there. It's only the mode that we want to move these people. Yeah? <clears throat> now that I've run through something called going back to the basics, I think we've lost something here. I think the country has lost something here. Yeah, it's good that the minister talked about a recovery plan. I think the recovery plan should also cover not only the pandemic, it also should cover the endemic and epidemic that we have been suffering from public transport and infrastructure. I think the pandemic is a small problem. The endemic and the epidemic is something that we need to address if we actually do want to move forward in this. Here, if we look at the improvement of uh, public transport and the economy, there's a great argument, you know, a great argument. This slide says nothing, yeah, productivity improves, 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 great, yeah, no problem. Everybody knows. But, you know, to mathematically formulate a financial model to say, yes, it works, how do you do it? That, that's the greatest challenge. Uh, so what I've looked at, or at least our team and HGB have looked at is economic case, financial case, and of course, something I've not put here called a strategic case. You know, whatever you do, an economic case over time must materialize itself into a cash, however well you want to talk about. It always must mesh. enhance taxes to the government, enhance productivity, so more work, more creation of wealth, taxes. Again, everything comes back to that, even an economic case. So what we have actually looked at and said that I think the best is to go back to the basics in many public projects where if you're doing a transit system or any public project, Run, run from the cash flows. You know what development expenditure you've got to do, spend. Some you borrow, you gear, some you come from government equity, comes from government cash, even a 10, 90, 50, 85 split, and it should run and accrue it basically on actually inflows, revenue inflows. And look at the ONM model that you need to actually spend. How much of money do you need to actually spend to get optimized operation, maintenance, and other incidentals to run the asset? And look at the cash flows and do, do look at ancillary revenues as well. You have a lot of ancillary revenues, public. For public projects, urban projects, you have naming rights, so many options that you can actually cash out upfront. You have something called land value capture as well that I put in there. How do you deal with land value capture in the model? At the start, not, not midway through, at the start. Because this land value capture has only been done in one country, Hong Kong. Highly urbanized, property prices are very high. So every time everybody talks about public tra transport being standalone, it's always referring to Hong Kong because they had a plan from the beginning. So the failure to have a plan from the beginning is where we are at. 
what I'm referring to. You have a plan, no, it doesn't matter. Because you know that operationally also you need to support some of this asset. So do you do what we call a whole life cycle cost to see whether, you know, replacement and who do we assign this accountability? What we have been doing conveniently is actually letting the government take on this responsibility, you know. So, so much so we end up with Prasarana, Repit, and so many other, other institutions that actually just, why can't the private sector do that? If, is, is a business case just to make profits, or is a business case can make it less negative? There is a business case. Government support, government funding, if reduced, the money that government gives every year to all these entities to operate, can it be reduced? Can the private sector come and actually do it? Yes, 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 yes. The answer is yes, definitely yes. There is a case for it. But how do you do it? You must go private sector. You must, must go, of course, you have a proper rules, regulations, properly guided, transparent as well. Hence, its relationship to the next topic as well. And of course, government must actively drive with policies as well. If you go here, uh, <coughs> You look at government policies, check balances between demand and supply. It's private vehicle ownership, that's the biggest culprit. But then again, you know, do you deny people car ownership just because you want a public transport? No, you don't. You, you tell them, okay, you buy the car, use it weekends. Have a color code. I think we don't have to go far. Our Lawatan, Sambal Blaja just need to cross the border to Singapore. And we can see they have different car schemes, you know, for off, off hours, weekends. You know, it, it start, it, we need to start to have this active policy to actually drive moral shift. 40% is no joke, even in KL. Leave alone the other two candidate cities, Penang and uh, Johor. They are already reaching a state where public transport is becoming a case. Uh, same congestion charges, area road pricing. For those of you who are old enough, you remember in the 80s, actually gantries went up in KL to actually look at area road pricing. You know, if you remember the central turning near Perkim, I remember seeing the gantry, a nice piece of egg gantry, never took off. Singapore started and they are way, way ahead of the road pricing, such that you know, it's actually if you drive into Singapore, even in peak hours, your, your journey times are so predictable that you, you feel like driving. Uh, whether you didn't, you know, competition with them doesn't matter. You're jumping into a public transport, become a norm. Urban parking charges in KL, you know, some people tell me it costs about 10 hours urban cities, 10, 10 Australian to park in uh, Melbourne, an hour to keep your car. And you can't keep there for more than an hour. That's the best part. I mean, you get in there, do your business and get out, or else come into the city with the public transport. I think, uh, of course, property taxes, uh, this is actually monetization as well, something that I will deal in the next slide. Again, what are your target model shifts? Motorcycles, are you going to make it convenient? If you really want motorcycles to go, make it so cheap. The fare box can actually start off with very cheap. It doesn't have to, and you know that the support when we go into operation is going to be high. As we start getting them accustomed and used to using public transport, and then slowly the fares can go. In fact, I was part of the team that did the Putra line, uh, HSS. We did the Putra line in 94 to 98 for Renong uh, again. If you had looked at the forecast of, of the revenue model at then, I, I was wondering which, which planet this was in, but I kept quiet, young boy, so even if you spoke up, you know, everybody will say he's trying to preach, so stay out of it. But you know, it's time that we start talking about it, or at least have a conversation about it. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. There are many, many policies, you know, color number plates are a gem, actually, you know. In Jakarta, it odd and even. They're using odd and even to, to, to control, you know, buy two cars if you're rich enough to drive, otherwise, Get one car, stay in one car, and start getting used to public transport. Most livable cities do have lesser vehicles. You pedestrianize, you cycle on that. So is that our vision? Is that where we want to go? Is it something ideal? So far, I know what we have been doing in left arm and the right arm has not been sort of consistent. Again, here, yeah, this is the land value capture thing, you know, how you actually account for it in your, or in your accounting treatment or financial model. Now, ta taxation, can you account for it? It's going to be indirect, you know. Special fees and levy, yes, these are all the ancillary revenues, naming rights. Uh, in fact, on MRT, we started what we call, we are the IC, by the way, for MRT 1 and 2, independent engineers. Naming rights is one of the monet early monetization schemes that we are doing. If a developer or anybody wanted naming rights here, and the meaning naming rights has a finite period. If you want to continue with the naming rights, five years, 10 years, you keep paying. Because after some time, you may want to change. Of course, the cost of changing actually is 
very little. A lot of people think if you change the whole system, it actually costs virtually nothing. It costs you less than a million. But if you actually every five years you buy, ask the guys to buy, this is your naming right, great opportunity to actually early monetization uh, and subsequent monetization as well. You get future cash flows as well. Direct property, as I said, Asian East Asian, the only guy, the Japanese JR are doing this as well, but they are having pro problem as well. Japanese Railway East, JR East, you know, we've been talking to them, they, they are having trouble. The only one in, in real sense is actually made is MTR out of Hong Kong. Uh, auction or deliverance rights, this is actually early cash out. Again, whether you want to cash out early, this is only a financial treatment, but you have to do it uh, and then find out which is the least, least negative if you're actually arguing for an economic case. You still have to do a financial model because don't forget the support system that you need to provide post completion of a public asset, if not operated properly, can leak you, leak you, leak you, leak you so badly that you don't want anyone to know about it. That nobody wants to talk about it because it's not the right, right thing to do. To champion it itself is a challenge. Again, uh, coming back to our basic case, actually here, sustainable. just for public transport projects, there is a case for private sector operators. In essence, where we are saying is, you know, if you want to actually move forward on this, you must. Again, you know, where accountability is, is made very transparent. Or even if they want to continue with the current structure with GLCs, accountability is a must. There must be effort to actually reduce uh, government support right throughout the life of the project. Of course, you know, if you look at the case of SMRT in Singapore, SMRT was actually created also around the same time, 96. It lingered around for four years. 2000, they went public. Of course, the Masi held them for 54% of, of them, and they went public, and it ran, ran, ran. And then 16, 16th year came. 2016, they realized that they needed heavy capex replacements, new capex replacement, replenishment in the maintenance regime. The routine, the periodic maintenance was not adequate. You needed heavy maintenance, which means capex replacement. So at that time, they said, guys, they delisted. SMRT was delisted. Tomase bought out all shareholders as well. That's the case. So you've got to be careful as well when you go down this road of you know, running private sector operators and you're trying to monetize too early. You know, is Tomase monetizing or government monetizing? Kazana monetizing or government monetizing? We've got to be very careful here. Accruals is the most important word here. How do you accrue? Who accrues the benefits? And nothing beats cash accruals. You know, I think we've been hiding under economic accruals for long enough. Huh? Okay, that takes me to the second part. Are we doing good with time, Sharizan? Yes, okay. yes we are. <laughs> second part is actually very, very related as well. I think privatization started in the 90s, the biggest being North-South, but I think some of you might even remember Shapadu Highway and NKSB that started much, much earlier. Yeah? Yeah. In fact, that was, in fact, much earlier, government had a toll road called in Slim River, if you know, but government actually built it in Slim River toll for those, those of you old enough. So if you actually look at the stream, the government built it in very nominal toll. The whole idea was actually not to recoup capex. The whole idea was at least opex-wise we could actually manage for the new asset that they created. Chapadu, of course, became a financial case, standalone financial case. And if my memory serves me right, there was no government support. But then came Plus, one of the greatest, greatest actually deals in our country that we did actually. You know why? We had something called a guaranteed offtake. In all this privatization, you had a guaranteed offtake. Traffic was guaranteed. So, you know, there's no, no, no. If you know how to run the asset, build the asset, run the asset properly, you have. Even if you do not get your revenue streams, there's a guaranteed upside provided by the government. Great, great. And very, very, I think that's the business case that I'm talking about. If you go to the next slide, this is the case for construction as well. The last bullet here talks about prioritization of business case. So they, there can be cases where government can support. They need not give full. Uh, government did the right thing at that time in 89. It should encourage privatization by providing the, say, guys, come in, private sector, come in. I will actually lease, slow down on this government support, government guarantee, guaranteed offtakes. A bit risk must be transferred to you. I can't be supporting you. But I think it went on to the other extreme, whereby government actually wanted to pass on a more and more and more risk. No, in school, I've told that you know what, what is it? You, you can't measure. If you can't measure risk, it's not risk. It's something called uncertainty. You have to be very clear. A lot of people get confused between risk and uncertainty. All businesses continue 
has uncertainty. If you can measure risk, you must be able to, then it's risk, it's a genuine risk, then you must be able to mitigate it. That's what the whole, whole privatization model is all about, mitigating risk. Again, I think this is a subject matter of my article, maybe about two weeks ago in the Star, if you, anyone had read it. This is a creation of a trust system that we need to reinvent among ourselves. I think the trust need to be provided to the public because they are the taxpayers. Government, what role? From a regulator, they got to move to a mindset of, of an enabler. Okay, you need to give some grants because you're not providing any form of guaranteed intake, offtake. So revenue streams are unstable, especially initial years. In any, any privatization, the, the, the initial years, you're going to suffer from that because you're going to spend a huge amount of capex in year minus three to zero, and then when money comes flowing in, the debt, the debt holders are waiting at the doors of ready to, 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 to take whatever free cash flows that you can generate, if you do generate. In fact, you do have some element of pre-borrowing here as well. Then private sector, how does the private sector organize here? Uh, the private sector is organized how we actually procure privatization projects. If you look at there's so much of interrelationship or so for the word incestuous relationship in the, in the private sector, right from the concessionaire, the con con contractor, the supplier. So, you know, everybody seemed to, the public seemed to think that everybody has a second bite of the cherry rather than the free cash flows the asset generates. The construction game in the, in the T minus three, during that period, a lot of leakage takes place. It shows, sometimes it's very clear, and lenders as well. So if all these three, if one has to get together and convince the public, Mr. Public, we are spending your money correctly. This is a public project. Again, as I mentioned again, just you're assigning a right to collect CES to somebody for a finite duration, for a finite purpose. CES, that's the definition of CES, by the way. And how do we move along this, okay? Planning recalibration, transparency, of course, shifting mindset and moving mindsets are given, risk and business case. If you look at the uh, policies, when I talk about policies, this is actually planning and recalibration, short term, medium term, uh, and, and also long term. Uh, you've got to synchronize between uh, local government, state government, and federal government. There's very little uh, uh, what we call central data system that is being uh, done. State government does one thing, the federal government does one thing, and privatization flies from the air and lands on the state government, and then it shut down the throat of local government. Of course, there's a lot of resistance to implementation of any other policies to encourage, to drive up demand. You can keep supplying, supplying, supplying till kingdom comes. If the, if the demand is not matched, then you know it's going to be a huge colossal waste of money, even whatever shape and form, be it equity from government or equity from the private sector. So consistent and correlate all this, it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight, but we need to start the journey. Um, and the next slide talks about it as well. So very close to what uh, YB Dr. Mustafa also talked about just now. Of course, he's, he's talking about uh, short term just to come out of the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about to come out of the epidemic and endemic that we have been suffering from for some time now. Yeah? So policy gaps, don't, very important policy gaps. You need policies. And decisions, uh, always remember that the very decision you make has consequences. So don't try to manage the consequences. Look at the decision, be aware of the consequences, and actively pursue them. You, know, you may even want to have some passive policies in between if you're actually doing too well, in case you don't have money to increase supply because the demand has grown. In not all cases where the supply is, is bad, uh, over, has been overprovided, there are cases where the demand has actually run more than the supply, but you say, hold on. Let's drive down the demand slowly first before we can get to the next round of supply. So I, I'm telling you, both, both are actually demand and supply game. You just need to go back to the basics to understand that. In fact, most of them who are old guards of, the, of, the, of, of various institutions in the countries are fully aware. Again, transparency, how do we go about it? I think the, one, the third bullet here is the most important business case. Is there a business case for this? It has to be done inter, in, internally by the government or use one of the big four, so you have infra consultants, whatever, but get the base case. Is there a base case, business case for this, okay? Do they need any form of government support in terms of grants, in terms of policies? You know, they may become a business case after three years. So can government give them a grant for three years? Can the banks be a bit more favorable in the first three years from their cash flows, especially when offtakes are not guaranteed? So when revenue are not guaranteed, it is not, it is not a risk, it is an uncertainty. 
The best transport modeling that you can do is always focus, focus, focus. It's, you know, for a short one of a better word is still looking through the magic crystal ball. Uh, you know, how you actually mitigate that looking through the crystal ball. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty in the modeling, the very modeling itself. Need to understand that, uh, of course, whoever you appoint the consult uh, must go through the concession period for transparency purpose, keep submitting audits. And the role of the private sector is very important in here. And of course, public, uh, all concession agreements got to be available for public view. No, no, there's no if and buts uh, in this if you want to achieve full transparency. And uh, guys, the, the, all the uh, measures that are giving need not happen concurrently. You need to start. Something needs to start, and it will take some time. Don't forget, we walk down the path, a different path. To walk around the new path, you need to start again. But you know, the mind, mind, the shifting and the changing of mindset needs to take place. Lenders, again, now you look at the lenders on this slide, you will see in some of the cases, the revenue are so unstable in the beginning years because you do not know. I'm opening shop, will people come and buy, buy from me? And you're not very sure. But you need to spend a whole lot of money renovating your shop or building a new shop. Same when you do a highway, you build a highway, you know, new, new asset right through somewhere. Will people use my highway? How will the highway growth of traffic that actually affects my revenue? You know, it's as good as actually, you know, this is the best case, best case. And so much so, the lenders actually starting point cut by 50%. And then I lend you, and then they determine that you need to have pre borrowing, and they impose other covenants that, you know, becomes a bit more. But they impose that because the private sector have not been behaving themselves. Again, I say, what is the role of the private sector? Should it be equity, long-term equity plus? Should concession be owned by pension funds? Should concession be in insurances who are actually in the long, long haul game? You know, rather than contractors or developers who, who seem to have a quick fix. Again, a rethink. Uh, that's the second one, private sector role. To, to clearly segregate these roles, uh, you need to do that. And government, the role of the government. To actually become an enabler, you've got to look at it from a different mindset. Stop looking at, from it from a regulator. I think if you go for a transparent, you know, and if jobs don't land on their desk on a surprise basis, I think this mind, this will be the easiest part to change, actually, the government, the government side, mindset. And of course, I mentioned about SES as well, dedicated infrastructure fund. You can always collect a SES on petrol, on something else that actually related, and you can actually use back for, for development, for grants, to shortfall, to support the gap funding in any infrastructure project. A good example, we just tended and lost out on LSS3. Uh, we worked very hard, but you know, end of the day, hey, LSS3 is a beautiful job, guaranteed uh, offtake. All you have to do is just give more sell rate to, to, to TMB. And then you get an agreement with PPA with uh, TMB. But unfortunately, out of the 500 megawatt, 400 megawatt went to, to foreigners. To, to companies that were led by foreign bid. Only one local company, but I think in this current four, LSS4, or renamed as LSS Mantari, for the obvious reasons of four, I think they have actually made it very difficult, actually made it mandatory that the bidders must be 100% local. I think I heard, I heard the minister speaking of such in, 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 in parliament itself. It was very good, actually. It's a guaranteed offtake. Why do you want foreigners to come in? You're not sending a rocket to the moon. You're just building a, a, a solar plant. And how difficult can a solar plant? You think Malaysians can't do solar plant? And yet, you know, and for whatever reasons, it was awarded to four, four foreign-led companies, 500 megawatts, only one Malaysian company. I think that too, they got one shot, 99. They didn't get the 100. Again, the last, not least, slide here, risk again. Again, I talked about it earlier as well. What is risk? How do you measure risk? If it's not measurable, in a real, real sense, it's not risk, it is a, actually doubt, uncertainty. Again, you know, if, if the private sector behaves well, we must give them an acceptable return. You know, I think that, that has gone. In road concession over the last, uh, uh, the chairman of Bursa as well was in EPU at that time. I think he knows me. <laughs> Whereby the control was introduced by IRR. All concession had a finite life up to 30, 40 years. And then a check on IRR equity was done to see whether reasonable. And then the concession ends. Fair. Very fair. If it's a shortfall, there's a possibility of an extension so that the private sector can, can achieve that. That's a very good model that allows the flexibility in the concession agreement. But then again, the private sector must behave. Here, just a business case. We must have coordinated actions from all, all governments. You know, you know, we keep identifying through our 
five-year planning, you know, and actually when development plans go for the Malaysia plan, it should come from the bottom. You know, states should look at it. Of course, you know, if there's no state agencies, like JKR is a federal agency, comes from the district JKR to state JKR, escalated to federal JKR, and then brought up for review. Every five years is done, EPU coordinates, re recalibrates and sends it out, and then there's an annual review on these budgets, what has been spent as development expenditure. You know, provisions for grants are actually allocated through, through, through the development expenditure by themselves. Clear identification. Uh, if you go and put money in something that's going to suck more money out of your system, public transport, and if you do not know that sucking, what is going to suck it out of you, then you lose out development expenditure opportunities. And the development expenditure comes from your consolidated fund. You know, it comes from your console. Everything that you collect goes into a console fund and then you know, rebudget every year. So it's no surprise sometimes when we say, you know, we are debt to GDP and all, all sort of measures are out of sync. Uh, again, this is, again, privatization. Is it viable to the private sector? Uh, benefits, again, I use the word benefits in the top part of private. Benefits, you know, accrual. We've got to, got to realize that everything don't come down to numbers. Economic case is there, but you need to run a financial model on an economic case as well to see which is the least worst to the government at, at this juncture. At least you rank them and then put strategic a cap, strategic cap and say it jumps across because it's got a strategic value. Again, if you actually go back and drill down into the detail, strategic must go to economic and economic must go to financial. There's no running away from it. However strategic it is, it must go to economics and economics will lead you back to, to, to financial. Uh, and business case, you know, whether there's a business case, I, I already talked about it earlier, and, you know, the role of independent consultants, continuous uh, presence of internet in consultants on the job. And last, you know, to sum up again, are we actually looking at two parts? The first part is actually public transport, and the bottom part is sustainable. They are one and the same. If I were to actually give you a statement and leave you with that, rather than going through what is on the slide, I will read as follows. Project cash flows must serve to defray optimal ops, operation and maintenance uh, regimes, including incidentals, uh, such that the, re the re resultant free cash flows left behind will lead to a least negative position, leading up to a positive, reasonable positive position so that we actually have best behavior from the government, lenders, and the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Datonichi, for uh, the very informative presentation on the uh, topic in hand. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and people viewing at home uh, in the offices, we now kick off the uh, Q&A session, Dato. Sure. Um, so, there's a few questions that came through while you were presenting. I think I will just pick and choose which ones in terms of the order of uh, relevance. Oh, so it's easy for you to answer. Your order? Uh, in my order. <laughs> there's, there's no here, but I'll pick one. So I, I think I'll, the first question here is that, um, um, given the state of the government's finances and the country's development, right. is it already too late for Malaysia to plan a more robust and well-connected public transport system? I think, uh, no, the answer is a quick no. It's not even a doubt. The answer no. is no. A quick no. Okay. Uh, it's not too late to go back and reinvent ourselves. You know, go back to the basics, that's one of my things. Say, go back and look at it. All form of spending, all form of equity, government equity, private security, there must be a reason why equity is put into a project. How do you trace the equity? In financial project, when we actually let out, as a financial case, we let out, government let out through a system of SES, it is a public project, don't forget about it. It's assessed, finite period, finite purpose. It's easy to track because the money is all accrued in a very simplistic manner. It goes through the concessionist accounts and you know, traceability is very easy. You just put one of the big fours onto it, we can audit it on an annual basis and trace what sort of numbers they're churning. However, when you actually go on an economic case, how do you trace it? Because the agglomeration effect, you know, you go back and say, yeah, GDP, you look, what if we, don't on, on be surprised, after this, when you go back, the analysts will be asking, so what's happening to MRT3? Who's getting MRT3? Every quarter when Can we I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> so the same thing, because, you know, if you look at the GDP numbers due to construction, so that's a quick, 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 quick fix that we have all been uh, accustomed to. 
You know, and so it's a bit of an endemic or epidemic, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that mindset got to be changed. Uh, yes, that's that. that is equally important. You can't, you can't uh, deny their, their place in the sun. But equally important is the secondary benefits that we do not accrue through the system because it's deemed economic, taxes, high, higher productivity, higher revenue to the government, higher revenue to the private sector, land value that you capture along the corridors. The guy pays more taxes, more development. So, but that, all this in economics, we call, we are presuming good, good behavior. Mm. And of course, don't forget Mr. Smith's uh, in, invisible hand. Yes. It's not so invisible. Yes. Okay. So I th thanks Atu, for the first response. So I think the pre-conclusion for the, for the session, we're not ending it. Oh, okay. The pre-conclusion, <laughs> as I understand it, on an overall oh, basis, is that the, the, it is high time for both the private and the public sector to consider working yeah. hand in hand Must. in a more effective manner. Must in the wake of COVID-19, post-MCO, the sector is going through a downturn for the last two right. and a half to three years, and there's not much big projects being rolled out or, or fast enough. Um, and I think, you know, uh, in the next coming months, there'll be a lot of expectations, especially within the investment community, yeah. on what are the yeah. policy measures of in recovery. Fact, in fact, Would you yeah, agree? If you look at the COVID, uh, thank God, you know, we've done it very well. Uh, touch wood, it doesn't actually uh, come out, resurface in parts or whatever it is. All the more because of the COVID, we need to spend our dollar very carefully. We need to see where our dollar is going for, and we need to maximize, the government needs to maximize the position on the dollar. Whether it's quick feel good, they want a long-term feel good, so they've got to realize some of it needs quick fix. Agreed. That's why I think uh, YB Mustafa spoke very correctly, short term. You need something to actually... So far, we've just seen the $4 billion from the stimulus. The, uh, I don't see Punjana. anything yet. I think those are... We see not, the figure, but we don't see anything else. Not, not related to construction. I think those other other ones, the ones that are related to construction are coming up. I think he did mention about MRT3. He talked about RTS. If not, he talked about Panbonio as well. Two states are, are, are a bit behind in terms of development as compared to Sumananjo. Mm -hmm. So those are real things that you need to look at. So where, where, where do you actually spend money? You spend money for short term, medium term, long term. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand why is this money being spent. We need a quick win to convince the riot that, yeah, we are doing the right thing. Of course, in the same breath, the next dollar that needs to go needs to go to the medium-term plan, because it, that we do need a quick win now, you know. And then there's another dollar that you're keeping down there that you want to use for a long-term game. So you need to differentiate between a short-term, medium-term, and long-term. It's very, very uh, philosophical about it. Sit down and actually look down. Go back to the basics. You yes, can't run away from going yes, back to the basics. More qualitative. Where, where is this money going? Going? What, what sort of fix are you looking for? Okay. Huh? Feel good. You're looking for a feel good? Yeah, okay, good. Spend, doesn't matter how you spend, just go and spend. Mm -hmm. go, go take the, the blue route whereby you're talking about you know, growth. You see counters moving, good, good counters. Nah, nah, nah. But you know, is that being translated in the long term to productivity, other things that elements that government should be earning via taxes because of productivity, more revenue to other companies who are not directly related to construction? Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a statement that uh, the government is now facing uh, lack of options in terms of uh, implementing mega projects or big projects, okay. uh, whether it's public transport or power or ports or highway, regardless. Uh, would you agree to that uh, statement? When you say lack of options, maybe you want to clarify, what do you mean? Is it uh, In terms or? of large-scale, high economic multiplier projects, okay. for example, MRT3 yeah. or high-speed rail. I think you, if you do remember, if you go back, MRT 1 and 2 are, are actually were, were supposed to be carried out in sequence. If you do not carry MRT 3, what's going to happen? All the technology that has been picked up by Malaysians in 1 and 2 will go do, go do other business. Why do you lose all that? Absolutely meaningless, actually. If you actually put numbers to it, loss. Do you know how much we have learned in the country? I know for a fact because we were the ICE for line 1 and line 2. And you could see the participation of Malaysian, level of participation by Malaysian companies in line one to line two. Don't forget, no? the last two large scale public transport was Star and Putra. Both came to a head in 1908 and 1999. CDRC was actually created, restructured, and then something called Prasarana came about in yep. 2000, assuming all the debts. And both were in privatization models, Star and Putra line. Both were created of, of, of those models. And you know, you assume that. And where did that debt go to? Mm -hmm. Do you know where did that debt go to? 
where? To, to Mr. Plus. He was rebundled into Plus. Mm. Okay. If you understand how money moves, then you will actually look at it a bit, bit more differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the question from the viewers. Uh, the next one is, um, which public transport assets needing major investments, which sector of the private sector should own this asset? Is it okay for foreign to own? Yes, yes. I think I'll, I'll take the last question first because you know, there's no, nothing ashamed about learning. Do not, do not think that we know everything. You know, the greatest challenge you know, is everybody is to know that you do not know. And how do you start to know? You start learning. You know, bring in the foreigners, give them a career mandate. You have five years, you need to nationalize the team, the ONM team. Very simple direction. Bring them, you know, best practices and slowly. It cannot overnight in stage. Five years you have, 15% 15, 15 localization. And don't start from the bottom. We don't need train operators. For heaven's sake, there. By default, you will definitely need train operators from Malaysia. Start from the top. Key management position, intermediate management position. Slowly, in five years, they should Malaysianize the, the, the total operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we don't have best practices, why not? Why, why, why we didn't do it? But not too late. You still can do it. If you do remember, they had Rapid. You know, you had a gentleman called, you know, Mr. Kanwain Vestra, who ran, uh, mm -hmm. ran Rapid together with uh, Prasrana at that time. I'm talking about 2000, 2001. Yes. Yeah. Where you were two different entity entities, yes. Rapid and Prasrana were separate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. In the interest of time, yeah. uh, I shall move on to probably the one of the million dollar questions that have been hanging okay, okay. over the heads of investors. Okay, what is Could it you mean? give us our, your view on uh, what would be the eventuality or uh, uh, planning for the MRT3 and high speed rail projects? What is your view in terms of what is the best way forward to execute these two projects? Okay, <clears throat> okay. It's, it's a bit of a loaded question. Yes. Yeah, if I were to answer, then you know, before you know exactly. it, some counters will be moving in the wrong direction. Let's not move the counters. <laughs> <laughs> if you actually look, well, actually go back to the basics. Uh, I said MRT one and MRT three is a continuation of MRT three. I've already answered that question. Yes. And high speed, yes. Do you need high speed? Is Malaysia big enough for high speed? Uh, what sort of uh, demand are you going to cannibalize? Are you going to cannibalize road demand or are you going to cannibalize air demand? And, you know, and then you actually look at the high speed. A lot of numbers are being thrown about. If you go back, um, just bear with me. I think the high speed thing has to be answered very correctly because if you go back in time, they set up SPAD. If you do remember, SPAD started high speed. And then they had another animal called MyHSR that came about. RTS also was started by SPAD. If you actually go back, you know, SPAD started all this because the investment was supposed to come through SPAD. Coordinated investments. So what LTA has done, we have not done. Although we created Land Transport Public Commission, or SPAD as the acronym in Malay, it never did. Now you go back to high speed, you ask the question, where, where is the traffic or ridership or whatever you call coming from? Simple question to you. For MRT3, is the mm. urban ridership. Urban, okay. HSR is the cross. I think that is us and answered already. With yeah. one and two, you know, there's us and answered. It's a necessity. MRT3 is a given. It must happen. Must happen. It even outranks. If you have a dollar, it outranks. It should take the first dollar from the government as opposed to the high speed. Okay. Can I leave you with that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have my own views on high speed. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Do you see? It's just the question you need to answer where is the ridership on high speed coming from? Ask and answer that question, then you will know. Is it cannibalizing? What sort of cannibalization is it doing? Would you drive for a business trip to Singapore in your car? Mm -hmm. What would be your preferred choice now, going to Singapore? Right now, going to Singapore? Yeah, for a meeting. I'll fly. Okay, then you have answered my question. Right. Yeah. So between... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it actually cannibalizes air, air travel. Yeah, so you know, do you want the airline industry to come back? In fact, that's the most busiest. If you consider Singapore as a domestic sector, that's the best sector, the most lucrative. There's no surprise. My window runs there, Asia runs there, even me. Despite going to Sleta, I still go to Subang and get, jump into a flight and go to Singapore. And we do go to Singapore mm. quite, quite frequently to deal with SMRT and all that. But no, very convenient uh, Singapore. You go to Subang, you don't go to KLI. So what, 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 what does it cannibalize? So what happens to the air, air travel? Yeah, yes. And you know, when you actually build an asset for 30, 40 billion, is there an OPEX that can support it? Is there a business case in that? There's got to be a continuous bleeding. 
that you how do you tackle that bleeding um, uh, that leaves less opportunity for other other public transport that you want to do in poor Klantan. So, 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 you, uh, yeah. so you're saying there's there's bigger and deeper cost and benefit considerations on high speed rail. Correct. Rather than go back and relook at it, yeah, and be transparent about it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a OPEX, I think, is a big, 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 big problem. Mm. Are we still good for time or are we Okay. Two minutes. Uh, yep. Yeah, Two sure. more minutes. So yeah. I think we'll just start closing the session. Uh, there's a few questions coming through while we were talking. Yeah. So on behalf of Dato Nichi, we would like to apologize to the viewers should there be no questions being answered. But I think over the course of the no, next no, no, no. couple of months, oh, anytime. I, Budget I think, 2021, every quarter. I think these questions that we see could slowly be answered. And uh, so without you know, um, pushing off through the time, um, I think uh, for this session, I think we would like to thank you, sure. uh, Dr. Nietzsche, for pleasure. his uh, yeah. participation and giving his yeah. uh, not-so-sensitive views <laughs> on uh, certain <laughs> projects. Maybe you would like to say something on ECRL, yeah. how has it been so far? Oh, it's a good project. Uh -huh. It's a damn good, good project, yeah. yeah. Because it bridges the east-west divide. It brings the state Klantan Trangano closer to, to, to Samaranjo, I mean, in Samaranjo to Klang Valley. Mm. If it actually even outranks high speed, if you were to ask me. At one time, it was a competitor to high speed. You could doing money spent internally, bulk of it, the benefits are all kept in the country. And you know, there was a big hue and cry over it. I, I wonder why. Okay. No. no? So hopefully, um, uh, in the next couple of months, we should probably see more clarity in terms of the direction of the infrastructure sector. And maybe, Dato, sure. one final word from you for the viewers. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then we, Brian, back to you, Brian. <laughs>